Um, so I'll say a few, I'm Aman, and I'll say a few words about Salam and Rise and Resistance, and we can start this discussion. So Salam, the idea behind it is to put together a pan-Asian, uh, pan-South Asian um, um, political imaginary from the left, and in a way that we see that's possible only through the diaspora. And in the current condition, it doesn't seem like something that's so much possible in the subcontinent uh, currently. Um, so there are two lines of work that we do. One is we provide capacity support for South Asian community organizations uh, here in the diaspora. And the other is um, political um, education. Um, and uh, through events like these, uh, and also writing pieces, um, and forming connections with uh, movements um, in the subcontinent and other organizing that's happening here on a more ideological level. Um, so that's our brief. And so this is a way for us to like put that forward too by having um, these events which talk about politics uh, in the subcontinent and uh, reflect on the, our role as well as being in the diaspora, being here, like what are we doing with regards to uh, organizing the politicization of South Asian issues here and supporting movements in the subcontinent um, together with uh, the uh, being uh, connected with other left internationalist organizations that are also here. So you can see we are, uh, there, there are quite some organizations here in the room that I can see. Um, so, this event is co-sponsored by uh, also Bariqua Resistance from Puerto Rico, Bol Co-op, um, Women's Democratic Front from Pakistan, um, then uh, Anak Bayan people are also here from the Philippines. Um, so, I mean, that, that is the idea behind this event is, and this is just another one in the series. We had one on Sri Lanka in May, where we were also talking about the issues that were happening there. and. We're looking at this event as like more of a point of departure for uh, gathering people to see how we can then study, agitate, and organize together. Um, and so we can, and, I, and also one note on the facilitation, we want this to be not a panel. This is not a panel. Um, <laughs> um, we'll have some context setting and grounding by uh, Mohiba. Um, and Sadia, and after that, we'll take in questions, comments, and open it up for a discussion. So I, I encourage everyone to participate um, directly. Thank you. Um, so, so your organization is called Aman. Salam. Salam. I'm Aman. You are Aman. There you go. Let's clear it. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Aman, and thank you to Salam and the Six Street Community Center for providing this amazing space um, to have this conversation. I can't help but think about the last time floods in Pakistan necessitated teachings and calls for solidarity, and it's interesting to sort of think about what has happened in those first years. It's also, I apologize to the Pakistanis in the room. Some of these points might, you know, be obvious to you because I was expecting to see, um, you know, more non-Pakistanis so kind of geared towards that. But um, just to sort of start off, you know, many of you may already be aware of the fact that, this is so clear, that Pakistan has seen record unprecedented levels of flooding this year caused, you know, on the one hand by climate events which are not natural as we know and we can go into detail about that. Um, in particular, the melting of glaciers. Um, Pakistan has about 7,200 glaciers, which is the largest number outside of the polar regions. Um, so record high temperatures in the summer led to obviously melting of the glaciers. On the other hand, uh, there was a shift in the monsoon um, and a record high levels of rainfall as well. And since it is primarily a riverine country, um, the combination of all these factors and other things that we can discuss, um, you know, land patterns and land use patterns, um, just led to a crisis that, you know, even Pakistan, which has seen its share of flooding uh, over the last, uh, you know, several decades, has never seen before. 
And I think the crisis, the, one of the things that makes this um, situation different from the 2010 floods, um, terrible as they were, is that I think even a country that was better situated to deal with crises of this nature would have found it impossible really to, to deal with this on, on its own. And one of, you know, some of the things I wanted to just lay out here for discussion is how, um, Pakistan, in what ways is Pakistan not even that country, right? And not to obviously feed into the kind of general uh, framing, discursive framing around Pakistan as like, you know, the most dangerous country in the world and overrun with terrorists and rogue nation, all of that. But really to think seriously about, like if we're going to talk about building solidarities and um, how we can sort of uh, respond in a productive way to what's happening um, halfway across the world, I think we really need to understand the, the place in its full context, right? So like the social, political, economic context. Um, and then we can move on to talking about climate justice issues and then what the role of you know, the, the West should be. So in, we can go into details in the, the sort of discussion section of like the, the scale of the disaster, right? How many people affected in what way? But really, like just to give you a sense, um, you know, anywhere between 1,500 to 1,700 people killed, 33 million affected, 600 or more of whom are children, 7.6 million displaced, um, and only 600,000 of those in official relief camps. So you can imagine what the conditions of um, all the others would be. At the very least, no drinking water, no sanitation, which automatically sets things up for um, huge disasters that are going to be unfolding, right? People have been warning about. So malaria is on the rise, other waterborne diseases on the rise, typhoid, dengue. Um, and then um, the one third of the country is underwater, it's a primarily agricultural country, um, which means that well, there's an immense food crisis um, already you know, unfolding. Um, and all of this, and, and, and of course, you know, textiles are Pakistan's major export, and so the devastation of the cotton crop is also going to mean, you know, if you start talking about IMF and debt regimes, it's going to mean another, you know, set of crises, economic crises on top of that, right? So complicating all of these factors is, um, as was also there in the 2010 flood, this idea, as, as I was saying, um, of Pakistan as a country that doesn't deserve international sympathy, right? And so then and now, um, the UN has been unable to raise even the meager asks that it put out um, you know, for, for Pakistan. And um, so it asked initially, uh, it tried to raise $19 million, I and mean, that's such a easily part of the fund drop in the ocean, um, and has raised it to $160 million, but has only been able um, oh, sorry, asked for 160 million, only been able to raise about 90 million dollars, right? Complicating this is the fact that um, there's really no coordinated uh, state-led disaster relief management system in place, despite the fact that there's been a series of natural disasters that um, should have, you know, necessitated. There is infrastructure, but there's been no political will to actually do planning um, and, and, um, and, and put resources into that. So. When we talk about the politics, um, we, we need to talk about where that political will comes from or should be coming from and why it's not there, right? Um, and then, um, so what you're left with is the fact that you have small organizations on the ground um, trying desperately to meet the needs of ordinary people, right? Because the state is like federal, the federal and provincial level is basically more or less absent, right? Um, and these organizations are hampered in their efforts, not only by the fact that they're small, but that even the, the funds that they're able to collect on an individual basis from people abroad are um, held up to the fact that Pakistan is on the green list, right? Um, and so there's immense amounts of, of you know, sort of um, focus on where money is coming from and all of that. So all of these, these things kind of play into the, the problems that, um, that we're seeing in terms of even like being able to address the, what can be addressed um, in this situation, right? Um, and what people have been telling me is that there's not even any systematic collection of data by the government on what is going on. I mean, some of that can be explained by the fact that, you know, um, roads have been flooded, bridges have collapsed, and so reaching people is difficult, but organizations on the ground are managing to reach people, and so it's not impossible, especially for a military the size of ours and the, a military that gets as many resources as um, ours does 
to, to be able to do this work, but conspicuously absent, right? So the other thing that um, the, all the, the disasters play out um, against is the long growing economic crisis that Pakistan finds itself in, which has only been exacerbated by the floods, right? So, and, and before this COVID, right? And of course, when we talk about the IMF, um, that's going to be a, a, a story that can be told through that, that same work, right? But even before the floods, um, Pakistan was seeing record high inflation, increase in energy prices, um, and decades of IMF imposed austerity and a bloated uh, defense uh, spending um, produced astronomical levels of precarity. Um, food insecurity was already at very high levels, um, you know, estimated at 16% of the population, which is before the floods, right? Um, and I just wanted to sort of throw out there that the IMF refused to relax its stringent austerity conditions um, attached to the release of its next tranche of zone, of the zone program in September, and instead demanded that Pakistan further slash price subsidies, whatever existed, raise energy prices, in, um, impose taxes on products that had been excluded up until this point, including medicines um, and other essentials. And again, even if we had a state that had the political will to respond to a disaster like this, it would be so completely hampered by these austerity conditions. Another complicating factor is the political crisis, the instability that um, is, uh, is playing itself out right now, um, which also is completely connected to the military's like, stranglehold on um, democratic politics um, and politics in general in Pakistan. And in the discussion, we can sort of you know expand on that. And then, of course, you know, connected to the military um, is and the reason why the military has been able to have this stranglehold on Pakistan is the geopolitical context and the position that Pakistan geographically finds itself in, the strategic um, position that Pakistan has unfortunately found itself in for several decades, right? So some of you may already know that in the early 1950s, um, the civil and military um, you know, ruling elite decided to throw in its lot with the US in the Cold War um, very deliberately um, and therefore, you know, um, as always happened, there was uh, immense amounts of repression of any kind of small d democratic forces, leave alone left-leaning um, forces. So that is something that has been ongoing. And the military has been in power directly or indirectly in Pakistan for the majority of the time that Pakistan has been independent, right? And so that has perverted um, politics, it has perverted uh, the possibility of democratic um, decision making at all kinds of levels. It has perverted the uh, economic priorities that Pakistan as a state has uh, um, expressed in its various budgets. Um, and then, again, bringing it back down to the geopolitical context, most recently, of course, was the war on terror um, and the, the vast amounts of money that flowed in in contrast to the meager amounts that we're seeing in terms of relief efforts, even from the US. The vast amounts of in billions of dollars money that flowed to the Pakistani military um, from the US you know, because of its um, importance to the U.S. Uh, in the war and occupation of, in, of Afghanistan, right? And so, um, interestingly, in the 2010 floods and then the 2005 um, earthquake, the framing of Pakistan as a security risk and threat was one of the ways in which the need for the uh, U.S. and its allies to step up and um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, help Pakistan was co couch Like if, if you don't help Pakistan, it's basically going to uh, collapse and be taken over by extremist forces, right? And you are interestingly now no longer really seeing that kind of a discourse. And there's not much happening um, in the media except for obviously the, the um, news uh, items that you see about the, the floods themselves. But the, there was a congressional briefing that I found that they talk about the possibility of that. And of course, the reason for that is that um, after 2014, when the US started to kind of cool down its, um, its presence in, in Afghanistan uh, as a precursor to withdrawal, um, that also meant that Pakistan became less of a priority as an ally. And so US-Pakistan relations have, until recently, been at a historic low, right? Um, and uh, China, uh, Pakistan then sort of, you know, uh, threw in its lot with China for its defense and security needs, and China, of course, 
has been very heavily involved in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and, and in other work forms. And that itself has sort of raised Pakistan's profile as um, an important um, sort of um, linchpin uh, for the region for the US. So, there's, so the floods actually uh, gave the administration, the current administration, the opening that it needed to convince Congress that they needed to fund the Pakistani military yet again, right? So, on the, so there was a certain, you know, sudden scurry of uh, U.S. State Department and defense um, <laughs> personnel um, coming through uh, Pakistan's Manta powers, um, who had USAID these days, was in Pakistan recently. Um, the U.S. Central Command and State Department have been very present. The, um, the, the, the Pakistani chief of the military uh, reached out to uh, the U.S. to ask for assistance in having the IMF funds released, the IMF was refusing to release. And um, in all of this, like the, the drama of like, the, the U.S. stepping up to help Pakistan, um, basically $13 million of, of, of a relief package has been released. At the same time, uh, this, the State Department approved a potential sale of F-16 equipment to Pakistan valued at $450 billion, right? So that tells you what the priorities really are and what really has been our course, right, as a, as a country, right? Um, obviously, same for counterterrorism objectives. And we've also seen the appointment of a full-time ambassador um, to Pakistan after a four-year gap. Um, and I just want to end, you know, with sort of the fact that you, the thing that we cannot discount and that everything kind of hangs on, uh, whatever conversation we end up having, is really about um, understanding the importance of the military in Pakistani politics, economy. Um, everything kind of hinges on that, understanding what the military is um, doing um, and uh, the ways in which it manipulates uh, the political context and the economic context uh, to its own uh, you know, benefit. So the chokehold on democratic politics, for example, has meant that you see a situation in, in which Imran Khan can emerge as an anti-imperialist voice. And I think this is something that has really begun to concern me because I'm seeing this being sort of um, be discussed in uh, deaf, you know, spaces in the US. Uh, and I've had to have these really bizarre conversations with, with uh, uh, young people telling them that Imran Khan is not actually an anti-imperialist, right? But the reason for that is that he, his voice is the only voice um, on the national stage that has taken on the drone strikes, but the, Pakistan, the Pakistani state's uh, involvement uh, in the war on terror um, and uh, has criticized the use of Pakistani bases for those drone strikes. And, um, and that really is the result of the fact that for the Pakistani military, Imran Khan, despite all of this, uh, because he wasn't directly at that time criticizing the military, was a very played a very important role of spoiler, right? Um, uh, to scuttle the, the sort of um, two major national level political parties because the, the, the military has not been happy with the return to democratic politics that happened in 2008 following the lawyer system, right? So since then the game has been to kind of somehow replace military power and so Imran Khan's uh, hybrid regime was an experiment in that, right? And that, of course, experiment failed because he became more of a liability um, to his populist politics for the army. So we can talk about that too. But really, what that shows us is that, um, thankfully, that, that, that the, the long history of Pakistan has been a history of the, the, um, the, the sort of um, attempt to kill uh, small d democratic politics, uh, especially of the left persuasion. And then that leaves the space open for these kinds of voices to emerge, right? Um, and the fact that through a large period in the global war on terror, civil society organizations in Pakistan are also not very um, happy to criticize the military because they saw it as a bulwark against extremist forces, right? So I think all of these things are things that we can kind of talk about. Um, just to sort of end, so that uh, you know, Mogiba can 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 uh, expand on these and bring um, the climate justice stuff to the fore. The the fallout of all of what's been happening that we need to watch out for, um, you know, as we start to think about ways to engage in solidarity politics or ways to understand what's happening in Pakistan, 
is to, to sort of pay attention to the political machinations at work, right? And try and understand them through the framework of the fact that the military is basically trying to retain its hold over, over politics and over, obviously, uh, the economy, right? Um, the, the, what I hinted at earlier, the economic fallout, the food insecurity, the massive levels of precarity um, and uh, famine that are likely to follow, the health crisis that's likely coming our way, and then um, the, the social and, and political fallout of it, which you know does create a space for um, left emergent left forces to kind of like step in. And I think that's another place where like you know we can really try and amplify those voices and make those kinds of alliances. So, thank you. For like uh, this was a very comprehensive like historical and also like current context of um, the floods in Pakistan at the moment and um, what are the roots of this problem and this tragedy. I uh, would extend more on uh, on like mapping the scale of the disaster, um, especially the disaster of like the current floods and how it's also like different from uh, the disasters that have happened in the past. Um, so situating it in numbers, as you know, Sadia already pointed out that you know there are 2,000 people who have been reported killed, and 35 million people displaced, and uh, this makes 15% of like Pakistan's population uh, affected by the floods um, at the moment. And we see that uh, Pakistan is facing a loss of 10 billion dollars due to uh, these floods. And um, why is this, um, you know, an important point? Because at, at at the at the moment, Pakistan's external debt amounts to 28 billion dollars. Um, and in Imran Khan's tenure, we see that you know, uh, 20 we see a 27 percent rise in inflation. Um, and who is hit by this inflation? Who is you know who is the uh, who are the people who are most vulnerable to all of these things? It's actually the poorest and the middle class because the elite class does not get affected by any of these things. Even by these tragedies and even by these disasters, they're not the one um, who are affected by it. Because even in the case of Pakistan, as we see, um, you know, um, the, the military class, as, as Sadia has pointed out, and the elites combined with the military class amass like, um, 17.4 uh, you know billion dollars and that that remains untouched so that is not touched who is being affected by this inflation it is uh, the poor class it is the middle class that is being affected um, so we see um, that this this is now the time that the global north needs to take responsibility why why in the case of uh, you know uh, the the climate crisis because the global north has exceeded uh, the safe emissions that it was supposed to do in 1939, like eight decades before this happened, like the situation that we're facing today. And Pakistan has not, it has barely used 0 0.5, 0 0.4, um, you know, percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions that it was supposed to use, um, you know, since 1959. So the global north has exceeded its emission by 90%. So we, at, at this moment, we, we have to see who is being affected and that's what we need to talk about and how imperialism and the imperial legacy plays a role in, in all of this. And so we have to look back at um, the colonial roots of this problem as well. This is a developing problem. This is not the first time that it is happening. It has happened in 2010. It, it has happened a lot of times before as well. And we see that how um, it was the British Empire building, building, you know, setting up these alliances with the local elite, making sure that they're restricting the space uh, and mobility of the people, locking them in places so that uh, when disaster struck, there is nowhere else that they could go to. Um, and so that's the role that imperialism, imperialism has played. When we even talk about the, um, you know, causes, one of the major causes of the 2010 floods in Pakistan, um, it, it was the, you know, uh, the infrastructure, the, the irrigation hydropower infrastructure that was built in, the Tonsa Barrage and the World, World Bank was involved in the reconstruction or uh, in uh, the repair of that, uh, of, uh, you know, the barrage and, you know, that contributed to the, to the floods in 2010 as well. At a national level, we see that 
The IMF loans, the, which amount up to $3 billion, are amputating us. It is, since 1988, Pakistan has signed a dozen loan agreements with the IMF. And every time, the structural adjustment plan, what does it say? It comes with a deal of liberalization of trade and finance, privatization of state-owned industries, drastic cut to public subsidies and commodification of nature. That has always been the deal that is made with Pakistan, uh, further weakening the economy within Pakistan, not letting us deal uh, with these tragedies when um, you know they arise um, within Pakistan. On an internal level, we have the development of CPEC, the economic corridor, corridor um, you know, of China that is being built in Pakistan, displacing even more people, making even more people uh, vulnerable to these crises and vulnerable to these tra tragedies um, and, and you know uh, when we look at Pakistan being like a chiefly agricultural economy what does that mean and you know how does it affect people we see that you know there has been a move from um, you know the capitalist farming model to like um, um, the, uh, a model where you know they um, have farmers on a contractual basis called basically a theka system where uh, the landowners basically give their land to poor farmers for on lease and they have to pay um, you know a, a certain amount uh, after you know the irrigation is done but what happens in the case of floods when these floods come it's not uh, the landowners who are going to be affected because they are going to take that money from uh, you know the, the peasants that they have loaned their land to, to the farmers that they've loaned their lands to, and it is the farmers that are affected because how are they going to make that money when the land is affected? But they don't care. They're not the ones who are going to be affected. It is always the poor class. It is always the impoverished people. So you know that is why there is a need to politicize. The climate crisis, and you know, I think it is the responsibility of um, you know the left to 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 look at that. We cannot just present these disasters as humanitarian crises because they are not just humanitarian crises. We need to take a, the global uh, North needs to take responsibility uh, of their uh, you know their hand in this destruction, their hand in this tragedy. It is time that you know they take responsibility for it. We cannot just say all of uh, all of us are in this together because this is not an equal relationship. We are not all. All of us are not together uh, on an equal level. Uh, there are there, there there is a global north who has been you know uh, oppressing on, on us on a larger scale, and we uh, as even as a state and as a people have not done enough to you know suffer this tragedy and suffer this crisis. Um, and again, like when we look at you know um, this, this the the debt the, in Pakistan, this even the debt, all of these um, IMF loans that we are getting also are you know geared towards still favoring the elite-driven economy, still favoring the military, and not really thinking about the people, not how they are affected. Um, and so, like just wrapping it all up, where does that put us? Like, what are activists demanding in Pakistan at the moment? Um, Beyond climate reparations, we need colonial reparations. Um, you know, for Pakistan, the global north needs to be responsible for it. They need to first of all cancel Pakistan debt, not only cancel the debt, but provide like investment and technological transfer for building like you know climate res resilient infrastructure, infrastructure that actually supports uh, the people and like is not actually only geared towards displacing them and only geared towards making. Um, the rich richer and on top of that you know um, a demand on the ground at the moment is also that you know the hundred billion dollar um, you know dollars that were committed to the poor countries in the Paris Accords that commitment has not been fulfilled and on top, top of that that should also be uh, you know um, that should also be honored and this is not something uh, that we uh, we are not begging for this this is something that you definitely uh, need to give us because you are responsible, we are not, and this is something that needs to be uh, discussed further. And with that, I will. Uh, thank you.